Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our next episode of Rewalk's Topics in Neurorehabilitation webcast. I'm Kathleen O'Donnell, and today we'll be talking with one of the leading researchers in walking recovery post-stroke, Mike Lewick. Mike is an associate professor of physical therapy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the associate director of the CLEAR Engineering Group, where his research focuses on the biomedical, neurophysiologic, energetic, and motor learning aspects of gait training post-stroke. Mike's talk today will highlight the significance of propulsion asymmetry post-stroke, and we'll introduce some of the research that he has done, which examines the concept of a propulsion reserve that patients can tap into to increase their propulsion symmetry. Hi, Mike. It's great to talk with you today. Yeah, thank you. All right, so thanks for having me. Um, I, I do want to talk about the importance of propulsion asymmetry after stroke. Um, and I thought it'd be good to get started by defining gait propulsion. Um, gait propulsion is the anteriorly directed force that comes from the ground um, and acts on the center of mass. So this is the force that's responsible for pushing you forward, um, which is why we know it's important for gait. Um, it represents the whole limbs force, um, and typically we measure it using force plates. Um, and that's, that either can be embedded in the ground or it can be embedded in a treadmill, um, but we're measuring the force from the ground on the person. And if we think about how that anterior posterior ground reaction force typically presents, it's beginning of stance, we have a braking force, um, which slows you down. As you move through mid stance, that, that force gets transmitted into an anteriorly directed force, which is now pushing you forwards. Okay. And so the magnitude of that anteriorly directed force is your propulsion force. It's, it's responsible for pushing you forwards. And we spend a lot of time thinking about propulsion because of its importance to gait. And gait speed is directly related to propulsion. So if this is your anterior posterior ground reaction force, your braking propulsion force during normal walking, as you speed up or slow down, those forces change. If you walk faster, it requires greater propulsion force. If you slow down, it requires less propulsion force. But you could also think about it in the other way. If there's less propulsion force, it's going to cause you to walk slower. If there's more propulsion force, it's going to, walk, or it's going to cause you to walk faster. Okay? And so we see this relationship both within subjects, and each of those little dots is, is an individual subject walking at different speeds, and you can see a fairly linear relationship. As that subject speeds up, they produce more propulsion force. But we also see that relationship with across subjects. So this is data out of the Delaware group that showed that, that across subjects, those who produce greater propulsive force walk faster. And so we think that propulsion forces are really important for helping people walk faster. Now, propulsion forces differ side to side, and they change based on whether you've had a stroke or not. Um, after stroke, propulsive forces um, typically go down on the paretic side. So which is not surprising. So if the paretic side is not producing a whole lot of force, propulsion is a force. Okay, so if the muscles can't produce force, then you're going to have a reduction in propulsion force. So there's two main determinants that, that are thought to contribute to propulsion force. The first being the, the muscle force coming around the ankle. So the plantar flexor muscles are typically affected after stroke. We tend to see more distal muscle weakness than proximal muscle weakness. And so this muscle, this decrease in activation and muscle atrophy, particularly around the ankle, um, results in a reduced plantar flexion moment. And so there's a reduction in the amount of push-off force coming from around the ankle. And so that presents us with one potential therapeutic target. So one thing you could do is, is, is approach the ankle muscles and say, can we get more bank from our block from the ankle muscles, which might increase propulsion? And groups have done that with pretty good success. But just getting increased ankle force or force around the ankle doesn't necessarily fix the problem because if your foot is underneath you and you produce more ankle force, all that does is push you up, which doesn't really help. We want to push yourself forward. And so the limb orientation is really critical. And so we, this has been called the trailing limb angle. It represents where the foot is relative to the center of mass. And our goal is to try to get the foot behind the center of mass as you're walking. And so that represents another potential therapeutic target. And in some cases, the trail limb angle is reduced for a variety of reasons. It could be that there's you know, flexion contracture, that they, they can't get sufficient hip extension. 
um, could be because of muscle flexibility. So there, there's a variety of reasons why you might not be able to get um, sufficient trial and angle. But both of those two things um, are, are thought to contribute. So when we look at propulsion forces, we can, we can look at a propulsion force, but we don't know whether that is normal or abnormal. And so that, that's why we have to introduce this concept of symmetry. And the whole reason why we think about symmetry is it gives us a benchmark for thinking about whether something is normal or not. Um, because in looking at this ground reaction force curve, you have no concept for whether or not that's normal or not. But if I show the other side, now you can see that there's a big disparity between left and right. So that's really all symmetry means. Is are the left and the right sides behaving in the same way. And so we don't typically try to restore symmetry just for symmetry, symmetry's sake. We try to restore symmetry because we want to get the paretic side or weaker side to look more like the non-paretic side or stronger side, just giving us a benchmark. And we think about symmetry in a lot of different ways. Um, there's lots of domains of symmetry. Um, there's been a lot of work done in spatial temporal asymmetry. There's a lot of work done in kinematics. We're talking specifically about kinetics here. But folks, we, we, we could look at muscle activation patterns, we could look at neurophysiology, we could look at structural and tissue mechanics side to side, and each of those contributes in a little different way. Um, and from my perspective, each of those has, has different relative importance, I think. Um, so for right now, all we're doing is talking about kinetic asymmetry. Um, so if we acknowledge that the, the system is asymmetric, Okay, the left and right side, the predic and non predic sides are, are not producing the same sort of motion, same sort of force. We said, well, isn't that normal for, for somebody with stroke? Um, you know, the system self-organizes. And there's lots of examples where, you know, the, the, we, we see the, the system self-organize. We optimize the way that we walk um, because of the way our body is structured. Okay, we pick a certain walking speed because to walk any faster or any slower, means that we're going to expend more energy. And so we optimize energy cost by picking a certain speed. We optimize energy cost by picking a certain step length, step width, stride frequency, those sorts of things. And so there's, there's optimization that occurs. And there was a quote you know, 25 years ago about the asymmetry related to the gait, saying, one would not expect a bilateral machine with motors of unequal power on each of its sides produce an optimal solution by using equal outputs from those motors. And that makes a lot of sense if you assume that there's no capacity to, to, to change the power from those motors. But we have good evidence in the literature now, again, that was 25 years ago, there's some good evidence in the literature that suggests that individuals can change what they're doing. And we see that in spatial temporal measures. Um, this is an example from um, split belt treadmill walking where we can see more symmetric step lengths that occur after walking on a, on a belt on a dual belt treadmill, the belts are split at different speeds. And we published some data showing that when provided with an impeding force for the center of mass, that people can produce more symmetric um, paretic propulsion ratios. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this study in a little bit. But the point is, this is exciting in that, that we know that there's some capacity for change. Uh, and the fact that we can increase forces, I think, is, is really encouraging. So when we think about forces, if we start at the, the like basics, like this, is, this is whole body or whole, whole limb force, OK? Um, and so in, in normal walking, when you land during early part, part of stance, there should be negative mechanical work done. And by the end of that stance phase, you should be producing positive mechanical work. That's your push off. And these are, this is a, a group of subjects um, with stroke. And if we look at the, the green, which is the non predic side, and the red, which is the predic, if you look at the peaks in peak of, of um, the, the red here in, in number one, it's a lot lower than the peak of the green in number three. Those are the, those are the respective push off powers. Okay? And so we see this asymmetry in push off. Now, this isn't necessarily just anterior posteriors, it's, it's whole limb. So this accounts for vertical and medial lateral, which is small, but, but the vertical is a big component. Now, if I told you that these were lower level individuals, slower walkers, you'd say, well, I'm not surprised that there's an asymmetry. But we see the same, same amount of asymmetry in our, in our higher function individuals. These were faster walkers. So even though these, these were folks that were walking faster, they still exhibited mechanical asymmetry okay so this this seems to propagate across 
kind of functional um, recovery level. And so that was whole limb um, power. We can look at individual joint power then, and we see a redistribution of muscle forces across different, different joints. So we know that there's more distal muscle weakness. And so if the distal joints are not contributing as much anymore, that has to go somewhere. And so that gets taken up largely by the hip. By the hip. Okay, so we see a redistribution typically from the ankle up to the hip. Okay, so this redistribution of, of muscles now means that the muscles are working in slightly different ways. Well, how do muscles work? Muscles work by requiring oxygen. Okay, so, so if muscles are working in different ways, then that means that we may be requiring different metabolic costs. And we know that people with stroke require, in some cases, up to twice as much oxygen consumption as, as somebody who's not had a stroke. So this is a significant problem. Um, we, we try to emphasize the fact that, that endurance is key, and part of the reason why endurance is reduced is because it costs so much more to walk. And so what we wanted to know was, does the oxygen cost now is that affected by the amount of propulsion that's happening? So if we get this redistribution of muscle forces, maybe that's being caused by the fact that they're not able to produce as much propulsion. So we came up with a, a series of studies that looked at this. And we compared regular walking, which you can see on the left here, unassisted walking, on a treadmill, that the, there's a little mask on our face because we're measuring um, oxygen costs. And we compared that to, to a force that's pulling somebody forward. And we were not exactly high tech. We took uh, theratubing, attached it to somebody's center of mass around their waist, attached it to the front of the treadmill, and pulled it forward. Okay, so while you're walking on the treadmill now, you have a constant force which is pulling you forward, which is great. It's something that's providing the propulsion force for you. And in the graph on the right, you can see our control subjects, our, our, our age mesh control subjects, had a significant reduction in their oxygen cost when they were provided with, a, with, with the assistance, which is great. What we didn't see was the same sort of benefit in our patients with stroke. We thought, well, okay, we would expect that if something's pulling them forward, they should get a benefit from it, but they don't. And it's probably in part because they are asymmetric to start with. And so we introduced a second con or a third condition now where they were provided with assistance only during their paretic propulsion. So we took that same theratubing, attached it to their paretic ankle, looped it around the front of the treadmill, and then attached it to the center of mass. So when the, the leg is in front of them in, at landing, the theratubing is on slack. So there's no force. The theratubing builds up its force, which you can see in this red plot at the top, builds up its force during the stance phase, peaking during propulsion. Okay, so as the leg goes into extension, stretches the theratubing, pulls the person forward until they pick up their foot, and then the force goes back down to zero. So this was a way of providing propulsion assistance only during paretic propulsion. And what we saw is that our patients with stroke now had a reduction, a significant reduction in their metabolic cost. So that tells us that it's not just enough to provide people with assistance, but we have to think about when we're providing those assistance. The timing really matters. It has to match. The, the, the problems that somebody is going to have. And so if they have an issue with paretic propulsion, then we need to intervene during paretic propulsion, not during the entire, the entire gait cycle. Okay, so this adds additional evidence that paretic propulsion is important for providing or for using oxygen. Okay, so we were able to bring down the oxygen cost when we provided them with appropriate paretic propulsion assistance. Okay. And we got further evidence for that by adding in another condition. So on the left, you see our anterior paretic condition. So this is only providing assistance during paretic propulsion. We had our typical or unassisted condition. And then we had a third condition, which the paratubing now wrapped all the way around. So it attached from their paretic ankle, looped all the way around, and then attached to their, the back of their center mass. So what this did is instead of providing them with paretic propulsion assistance, it provided them with paretic, paretic propulsion resistance. So it pulled them back. And what we saw was that with our, our there's a couple things you can see here first. Let me, let me just back up for a second. If you look at the left side, our control subjects, you can see that they're always lower than our stroke subjects. Our stroke subjects were always providing more oxygen 
than our, uh, or always using more oxygen than our control signals, right? But the other thing we can see is that when, when paretic, when, when, assistance, when assistance was provided, oxygen cost goes down in both groups. When resistance is provided, oxygen cost goes up, okay? So because we're manipulating propulsion and we're seeing a change in the oxygen, this is just additional evidence that propulsion is really important for oxygen use while you're walking. So if we can bring down the oxygen cost for, for people with stroke, or then if we can, if we can enhance their, their paretic propulsion, we should be able to bring down their oxygen cost. So a couple of key takeaways from this is that if you look at our, um, our patients with stroke, providing assistance brings down their oxygen cost. And when you look at our control subjects, providing them with resistance increases their oxygen cost. So it's more like making our control subjects walk more like our individuals with stroke. Okay, it's kind of a proof of concept. So, um, so this is one of the reasons why we spend so much time thinking about it, is because we think it's important for oxygen cost, energy use. Um, which leads me then to this presence of a propulsive reserve. And is there anything we can do about it? Um, we know that there's activation deficits in muscles. Um, we know that there's, there's a, a robust um, walking speed reserve. Um, so that in, in, in a lot, not everybody, but in a lot of subjects, they can walk a lot faster, they just choose not to. But they have this reserve. And so we wanted to know whether or not there was the ability to produce more propulsion force. And so again, very low tech, we used our, our TheraBand attached to the center of mass, and what you can't see is, is student holding the other end of that TheraBand, pulling backwards on our participants. And we did it in a stepwise fashion where we, we went from zero, so there was no resistance. We went two and a half percent of body weight, five percent, seven and a half, and ten percent of body weight, and then kind of worked our way back down. Okay, so you know they, they were exposed to different levels of resistance. So what we wanted to know was whether or not people were going to be able to change their paretic side or their non-paretic side. And that, that could lead us to one of several hypotheses. So we might assume that if they can't produce any more force with their paretic side, that they're going to have to compensate by only increasing their non-paretic side, which is what we hoped would not happen. Um, what we were hoping was going to happen was that we were going to see an increase in the paretic propulsion. Um, and I guess the third alternative would be that they don't increase either side and they just fall off the back of the treadmill, which we really hope didn't happen. And as it turns out, what we have here is our stepwise going up from zero to two and a half, five, seven and a half, and 10 percent body weight um, resistance. The black bars are the predic side, the gray bars are our non predic side. So, of course, the non predic side is already producing more propulsion than the predic side. But what you see is that both of them go up as we provide resistance. And in fact, they become more symmetric, statistically more symmetric, by the time you get to 10% body weight resistance. And if you look at the numbers, on the paretic side, they're producing twice as much paretic propulsion at 10% body weight than they did at zero. So they have the capacity to produce at least twice as much force as they do during normal walking, which is encouraging. The other thing, and probably the thing I think is even more encouraging, is what happened when we stepped it back down and reduced the amount of force. Because you see that stepwise reduction. If we go all the way back down to the zero, where we remove the, the restraining force, we see that the paretic side now is producing more force than it was initially. And that's really encouraging, because what it means is that once, once they were exposed, the opportunity of producing more force that they were able to continue to produce more. They, they must have seen some benefit, whether they were able to explicitly state that or not. They, they felt some benefit to producing more force and they continued to do it once the impeding force was removed. So that I think is really encouraging and, and maybe you know, stands to some training protocol that we might be able to institute. Um, so I talked earlier about how there were two determinants of propulsion force that we were particularly interested in. And we wanted to know which of those were contributing to this increase in propulsion force. So we looked at the trailing limb angle and we looked at the plantar flexion moment. The plantar flexion moment's down at the bottom and you can see that nice cloud, which suggests that it had no bearing on whether or not they were increasing their propulsion force. But what did play a key role was the increase in trailing limb angle. So the people who increased their trailing limb angle more showed a greater increase in their propulsion force. 
Okay, so which suggests that the trail of the mangle is playing a key role in, in being able to help people produce more force. And so we've looked a little bit more at, at the role of trail and limb angle. And we published a paper last year, which was really a challenge from my, um, my colleague and collaborator, Greg Sawicki, who said, you know, you're talking about trial and limb angle, which is supposed to represent the anterior ground reaction force. We even know that that's what it is. And I said, well, we have the data, let's go look at it. And that's where this paper came from. And sure enough, it is. So the, the, the trail and limb angle is a really nice surrogate for the anterior angle of the ground reaction force. It matches it pretty closely with pretty high R squared values. Um, and so there's, there's a nice relationship between the trailing limb angle and the anterior ground reaction force, and then subsequently the peak propulsion force. And so which suggests that as you modulate trailing limb angle, you should be able to increase your propulsion force. So, but again, these are all across subjects. These are not within subjects. So that's, that's kind of a caveat to that. Um, and so, you know, we wonder whether or not we have the capacity to be able to change. And, and people have used um, different forms of feedback to be able to modulate um, propulsion forces. And, and this has been done. Um, Jason Franz did it with older, with healthy older adults, um, gave them visual feedback of propulsion force. And sure enough, healthy older adults were able to increase their propulsion force. And more, more recently, um, Trisha Kessar down at Emory was able to produce um, increases in paretic propulsion force using visual biofeedback um, in a really nice study that showed that um, you know th these are somewhat sustainable at least for for short durations um, with the use of visual feedback. And so you know visual feedback is a really powerful training tool, and and this might be one avenue that we we use that that might help us to exploit this propulsive reserve that we think is available to patients. Um, and so, you know, propulsion is one thing. And, you know, we, we, I've talked, I've spent a lot of time talking about propulsion, but just keeping in mind that propulsion is one part of the gate cycle. And, you know, we have to, we have to make sure that we're, we're supported during the gate cycle, that we're providing adequate propulsion during the gate cycle, and that your, your swing leg is advancing in a safe way and that you're not tripping over the ground as you're swinging forward. So, you know, propulsion is important, um, but I, I do want to just emphasize that it's it's one aspect of gait, and, and we can't just emphasize propulsion, but that we need to make sure that in order to, to make sure that people are walking most effectively um, and safely, we need to pay attention to the entire gait cycle. Um, so I hope I've been able to put some of this propulsion work into context, um, while hopefully not neglecting too much of the other components um, of gait. Um, and just wanted to acknowledge uh, my collaborators that I work with, um, both at UNC. Um, some of these are, are former students. Um, Greg Swicky is now down at Georgia Tech. Um, Jason Friend. Some of the work that I presented was done by Dominic Ferris, um, who was a postdoc um, working with Greg Swicky, um, as well as some of the funding sources. So, thank you. Thanks, Mike, for an enlightening presentation. Uh, you know, one of the things that I really love about this talk is that it, it kind of expands on some of the understanding of the mechanics of gait and predic propulsion that we introduced in some of the earlier talks. Um, but it also gives us kind of a, a nice hope for, you know, the fact that we, we have this propulsion reserve and ultimately we have this ability to, to train. Uh, so I think this is really exciting for us to hear from you. Uh, did want to ask you a few questions. Um, and I think the first one is really, you know, throughout your talk, you identified what propulsion is and, and really having, you know, two main subcomponents of propulsion. So we have the trailing limb angle, and then we also have the actual force produced by the plantar flexors. Um, and I was just wondering if you could comment on, you know, what are some of the compensatory gait mechanics that you, you might see evolve um, if we don't have one or both of these things, or even if we just don't have the timing coordinated between the two of them? Yeah, those are those are good questions. Um, so some of the some of the compensations we typically see with a reduction in propulsion um, is that shift up the chain. So for example, if, if there's a lack of plantar flexion force, we have to see a compensation somewhere, whether that comes from the, the paretic hip, um, which we sometimes see. So we might see an increase in hip flexion. Um, in some cases, we see a compensation on the other side, where the other side is pushing off further, in which case you might see changes in, in step length. Um, so sometimes that step length um, correlates really nicely with the propulsion asymmetry. Um, 
but but the force needs to go somewhere um, or come from somewhere. Um, and so the compensations typically might be, as I said, increase in, in hip, hip flexion. Um, in some cases we see increases in circumduction. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty variable. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it's important to obviously everything's all connected. So if it's not coming from the ankle, then it has to get, you know, somewhere else has to come into play. And that's how we develop those, those behaviors. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I've obviously been involved in the propulsion world for a long time. You've obviously been involved in the propulsion world for a long time. But, you know, one of the challenges that I think a lot of clinicians that are, you know, out in the field are really uh, under or experiencing is that it's really hard to kind of track or measure differences in propulsion without some of the equipment that you have in your lab. Uh, you know, so without the force plates or without the, the you know, the force treadmills. Um, do you have any advice for those clinicians who um, maybe are, are interested in, in pay, paying more attention to propulsion, but maybe don't have all the high-tech equipment that, that you have access to? Yeah, that's that's a great point because, you know, we, we measure propulsion really robustly in the lab, right? So we have the ability to measure force plates at, you know, a thousand hertz um, and then be able to look at fine detail related to propulsion force, which you obviously can't do in a clinic. Um, but I, I don't want to underestimate clinicians' eyes either. Um, and there was there was a paper 15 years ago, um, maybe done in Australia, where they they quantified the ability to push the, the ability of clinicians to be able to judge push off. Now they weren't looking at propulsion; they were looking at ankle um, ankle power, ankle joint power. Um, but clinicians do a really good job of that. And so, at least for ankle joint power, we could say that clinicians do a good job of estimating how much push off force there is. Um, on the same note, I think we can we have a pretty good sense for how much trailing limb angle there is, especially if you if you quantify that as a step length. I think that makes it a little bit easier to visualize. Um, but so you know, clinically, I think we have the ability to observe that. I mean, that's what our observational gait analysis skills are for. Um, but there's also the, there's the capacity to, to develop newer tools, and people are develop are working on you know development of devices that allow us to be able to come up with surrogates of propulsion. Um, I, was, I was on a paper with Jason Franz last year that um, we, we published a paper on how ankle, um, ankle acceleration may serve as a nice surrogate for propulsion force. And I know other groups are working on, on similar sorts of things um, that, that may be even more robust. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, I think there's lots of capacity and I think we're, we're at an exciting time now where components are becoming so miniaturized that we can take some really small sensors and be able to slap something on something, somebody with, with minimal calibration and be able to get an in-clinic estimate of some measures that we previously would have had to rely on a gate lab to really get. Uh, so, you know, I guess the short answer is rely on your eyes first and know that there's, there's devices that are on their way. Yeah, and that's, that's really exciting. Um, I'm excited to see what those new sensors look like too. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm also, I think one of the most exciting things about your talk and, and really one of the main reasons that I reached out to you was this, this concept of a propulsion reserve and, and this idea that, um, you know, patients can do more and they can do better. And we, we have, you know, a long ways to go before we really feel like somebody's, you know, maxed out on what their potential recovery could be. Uh, I'm curious to, to hear from you, uh, whether it's statistically or anecdotally, do, do you find that some patients, you know, were, seem to be able to tap into this reserve better than others, um, or even just respond to some of the cues that you were giving better than others? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a really challenging question um, because it, it requires large numbers to be able to kind of tease those things out. We unfortunately don't have those data, um, but I, I would, that's like the million dollar question because if you know who has the capacity to be able to increase, like those are the ones you target. Right. And people who may not have that capacity, then those are the folks who are probably going to have to require more unassisted devices, for example. Um, and, and so being able to dichotomize those groups really allows us to be able to prioritize which treatment intervention those groups go into. So rather than applying the same thing to everybody, which we really don't want to do, we have a little bit more information about this is right for this person, this is right for somebody else. We just don't have that information yet. Um, but I love where you're going with that idea. Great. Okay. We'll stay tuned on that one. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, you know, I guess lastly, for, for any of our viewers who are interested in learning more about any of the studies that you've participated in um, or run, 
um, or just anything, any more resources that you can provide them for where they can learn more about propulsion asymmetry or about the propulsion reserve? Um, you know, what recommendations would you have for them? Yeah, so there were, you know, there were some papers listed in, in the talk that I gave. I, I tried to cite those, so those, those can all be looked up on PubMed. Um, and there's, there's some nice review articles as well um, on propulsion. Um, there was one last year, Rick Neptune was a senior author on, um, on credit propulsion. And then there's, there's another one that that's, we're working on right now um, that, that hopefully will be out in the next few months. Um, so there are some good resources out in uh, you know, on PubMed. Um, so. Okay, great. And we'll actually include links to some of those, those papers that you mentioned in the description for this video so that our viewers will be able to access that as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for a great talk, Mike. And uh, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And to our viewers, we hope that you've been finding these talks educational and useful. Um, so please make sure to like and subscribe this video using the buttons below. And feel free to suggest any topics or speakers that you would like to see in upcoming episodes using the comments section. Uh, we hope that you will tune in with us again next week and have a great week, everyone.